If you're going to become an expert in your own aging and your own longevity, then you need to understand what the research is working towards. Not how to interpret a specific study, but what the underlying motive is behind the aging research. Once you understand the basics of this, you can start understanding what you need to do within your own life. With education comes adherence. So you can learn the process and then apply it to yourself. So let's dive in. One of the first things that researchers learn when they start discussing aging and researching aging is the difference between what is called a modifiable risk factor and a non-modifiable risk factor. A non-modifiable risk factor is something you cannot change. Aging, as of right now, is a non-modifiable risk factor. We cannot change the fact that we age, and we cannot currently change the fact that aging contributes to our ultimate mortality. Another modifiable uh, risk factor would be something like uh, our race, uh, even our gender, our genetic predisposition to disease. Okay, then we have modifiable risk factors. Modifiable risk factors are things like smoking, drinking, things that we know are bad and we can change and that can adjust our overall risk, okay? The goal of the aging research, and I'll say this again, the goal of the aging research is ultimately to make aging a modifiable risk factor, to make it something that we can alter a little bit by understanding the biomarkers and ultimately improve our quality of life. Never in any of the aging research will you see the words immortality. We are not trying to say, oh, we wanna do this so we can live forever, or we wanna do this so we can live to X amount. It is much more about health span. How do we reduce the impact of age-related diseases on our overall quality of life? Okay. We're still gonna have regular risk factors that are gonna contribute to our ultimate mortality. But aging maybe doesn't need to be something that crushes our quality of life in the second half or the back half of our life, right? Anyhow, let's move in to the more nuancy stuff. So there was a 1993 study published in the journal Nature, and this was one of the first studies that really opened researchers' eyes to aging. It was done on worms. Now, it sounds funny, but a lot of early longevity studies are done on worms because they're easy organisms to study. And what they found is that when these worms had a specific mutation to a gene called the DAF2 gene, okay, they lived twice as long as worms that did not have this mutation. What the heck does that mean? Well, in worms, DAF2 is the only receptor for IGF1, insulin-like growth factor. Okay, insulin-like growth factor is more complicated in human models, of course, but insulin-like growth factor is where you receive in a sense, in essentially insulin to ultimately trigger growth, and this is making it very colloquial. But in a worm, if you were to mutate this DAF2 so that they couldn't receive IGF, they lived longer. So this opened the door saying like, wait a minute, there's a mechanism that these pro-growth signals have to do with aging. What does that lead us to? caloric restriction. And that's where the discussion started coming into play. Like, wait a minute, if we're eating less, there's less IGF hitting the receptor, and maybe it's gonna have a similar result as it did on these worms. Well, insert the research on caloric restriction. Here we go. Caloric restriction is a stressor, and we'll explain more about that in a little bit, but when you deprive yourself of calories, it is a stressor to the body. Now, there was a study that was published in the journal Aging Cell that was very fascinating. Okay, now this study took a look at mice, and they did what is called knockout. Now, knockout is where they take a specific gene and they knock it out. They basically make it non-existent or they make it null and void. When they took mice and they made their FO exogene dysfunctional, they did not get the positive effect from caloric restriction on aging. What does this mean in very simple terms? FO exo is a stress response uh, gene, right? When we stress ourselves with exercise or caloric restriction, FO exo upregulates other processes in the body to make us stronger to deal with said stressor. When we knock out FO exo, adaptations did not occur, meaning mice that were calorically restricted did not get the benefits. But mice that did have the FOXO, that was not knocked out, when they had caloric restriction, they did get the longevity benefits. So that is when the research on longevity really started to get intense. Now it goes beyond that. There's also something called NAD, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail as we get into the latter part of this video, because it's a very important piece. But when we burn fuel, 
that uses up something called NAD, okay? Nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide. Okay, excess or spare NAD when we're not using a lot of it, like during caloric restriction, can actually go and activate things called sirtuins and can actually have an impact on FOXO and can have an impact on rejuvenation and can potentially have an impact on all these different cellular cascades that occur as a result. Now, today's video is sponsored by a company called Verso, and that is what is called NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, which plays a very key role in how NAD works within the body. That's why when you look at researchers like Dr. David Sinclair, he's talking a whole lot about what is called nicotinamide riboside and nicotinamide mononucleotide. They are very, very interesting compounds that may have a very powerful effect on ultimately NAD, sirtuins, and then there's also resveratrol in Verso, something called transresveratrol, which seems to, looking at the research, have a pretty powerful impact directly on sirtuins too. So the long and the short of it is, it can essentially help with that caloric restriction. So a lot of researchers are talking about it. The cool thing about Verso is they refrigerate everything. Everything is shipped really quick so that it maintains its integrity because you really should be refrigerating nicotinamide mononucleotide and you should be refrigerating transresveratrol. So they ship it so fast and that way you can put it in your fridge and keep it that way. So since it's actually stored in the cold, that makes them very, very unique. Anyhow, that link is down below, something that I totally recommend for people that are are really looking at just watching their overall health span and improving their quality of life as time goes on. So again, that link is down below. Definitely, definitely worth checking them out and reading up on them as well. So that link is in the description for 20% off. So the big challenge that we face with aging research is that it's not exactly morally or ethically doable to say, let's look at someone's entire life and see what we can do to make them live longer, have a higher quality of life or whatever. It's just not really feasible. And economically, to monitor someone for 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years isn't really possible either. So what ends up happening is we look at these subcategories of what we see as aging and longevity. Subcategories like FOXO, like we talked about, like mitochondrial hormesis, like we'll talk about in a second. These subcategories are called biomarkers of aging. And when we understand and various biomarkers, we can put together little pieces of the puzzle. And now research is using machine learning to take these little biomarkers and these little pieces from thousands and thousands of study participants to ultimately aggregate data to learn what is called a biological age. A biological age is how old our cells are based upon these different biomarkers, not just our chronological age, what we show on a calendar. Okay, there's two totally different things, and the more you learn about aging and longevity research, you realize, wow, what the heck? Chronological age is completely different than how my body feels inside, right? Now I wanna dive into the cellular mechanisms that are potentially involved in a lot of this longevity research, and now is where you can really start to put the pieces together in your own life. The first one is called mitohormesis. Now the mitochondria are the components of our cells where we manufacture energy, right? Where we manufacture fats, or we manufacture ketones, or we manufacture glucose to turn it into energy, okay? Hormesis is a stressor, a hormetic stressor. When you exercise, you are creating a stressor, okay? You are causing stress and your body adapts to said stress and gets stronger. Now what's crazy is up until like 2000-ish, we used to think that the primary driver of aging was actually reactive oxygen species, ROS, oxidative stress. Hence why in the 1990s, there was such a huge push for antioxidants being such a powerful thing. Oh, load up on antioxidants, it's the best way to combat aging. Well, when you start looking at the newer data and you start looking at what happened, you realize that's not the case. There's no doubt that reactive oxygen species in a high amount in like too much is bad, okay? It damages the cell membrane. Lipid peroxidation damages the cell membrane. This can lead to mutations, can lead to potential cancers. There's nothing good that comes from too much reactive oxygen species. But what researchers started to find was that when they gave subjects high dosages of antioxidants to try to combat the oxidative stress, it made the situation worse. Why would it make the situation worse? Because you are providing such a protective mechanism over the cell by giving so much antioxidant that the cell is not able to ever develop an adaptation. It's not getting the hormetic stressor. It's lived a cush little 
posh life where it's entitled and it gets whatever it wants, and then when crap hits the fan, it doesn't know how to function because it has zero stress response or ability to deal or resiliency. This is a problem, and if you look at the data and you look at the research, you find that people that are extreme athletes, people that exercise a ton, they have a higher life expectancy than people that are totally inactive. But people that are moderately active have a higher life expectancy than people that are extremely active. Why? Because extremely active people inflict so much stress upon their body that their body can't deal with it. Sedentary people don't inflict enough stress on their body, so their cells are weak and don't have resiliency. Moderately active people get just the right amount to make the cell stronger to deal. That doesn't mean you don't do intense activity, it means you do periodized intense activity. That's why I'm a huge fan with your exercise. Periods of intense workouts for like a week, and then one to two deloading weeks of just moderate movement. So high intensity interval, tra interval training like four days per week, five days per week in an intense fashion when you're feeling good and you're getting sleep, and then two weeks of zone two easy cardio and mild strength training to maintain muscle and let yourself recover, and then stress yourself. Stress, recover, stress, recover. Okay, those of us that really just beat our bodies in the ground day in and day out, we might be doing ourselves more damage than good. That's why sometimes you've seen that, you know, 40-year-old runner running down the street, but he looks like he's 80 because he's been beating his heels into the pavement for the last 30 years, running like crazy, it happens. But what we've learned now is that reactive oxygen species is not a driver of aging, it is a signaling molecule that allows us to adapt to aging, okay? So by inflicting this stress, it is a signaling molecule that triggers adaptations that can help us. There was a study that was published in the journal Cell Metabolism, and it looked at probably the most important antioxidant within our body, superoxide dismutase 2. Okay, it took a look at mice and it knocked out superoxide dismutase. Okay, what's important to note here is that caloric restriction is a stressor. Caloric restriction will trigger oxidative damage, oxidative stress, okay, it will. So what they did in these mice is they knocked out this key antioxidant in the body, and then they had them go through caloric restriction. When they were calorically restricted, the mice that had SOD2, superoxide uh, dismutase 2 knocked out, they did not get the benefits of caloric restriction. Okay, whereas the mice that still had superoxide dismutase, it was not knocked out, they did get the benefits of caloric restriction. What this teaches us is that caloric restriction is a hormetic stressor that triggers an adaptation called mitohormesis, a mitochondrial hormetic stressor, and if we do not have the ability to deal with that stressor, we don't get the benefit. So ultimately, caloric restriction is a stressor, and that's potentially why it helps us you know, with the longevity quality of life thing. So it comes back to the extreme activity, and then being able to take a break, but also exposure to extreme temperatures, extreme heat, extreme cold. That's why people that do ice plunges every day, although very good for the brain, I don't know if it's the best strategy. I usually recommend doing a cold plunge in lieu of a workout maybe a couple days per week. Okay, don't do it, not doing it every day. Now, I'm not a research scientist, so I can't say for certain, but it seems like it's a little too much, right? Same thing with sauna. If you do it every day, there's benefits, but are you possibly inflicting so much stress that's hard for your body to deal with it? Let's talk about some other signaling pathways that have to do with caloric restriction specifically. Because caloric restriction is the big overarching theme that we see in the research world right now. But it's not just eating less. There's different components to it. The first one, like we already talked about, is gonna be that relationship with stress and upregulating uh, FOXO and upregulating different pathways downstream from that. But we've covered that base, let's talk about some other ones. The next one we have to talk about is mTOR versus FOXO3. mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, or mechanistic target of rapamycin, depending who you talk to, mTOR is the growth signal. When we eat, when we lift weights, we signal mTOR, and that is growth building. Anytime we consume even a fraction of a calorie, we are stimulating mTOR and growth. The opposite of mTOR is going to be autophagy and upregulation of FOXO3. Essentially, caloric restriction is inhibiting the building. When you deprive yourself of calories, anytime you're in a total overall deficit, you are going to have lower levels of mTOR, which means that your body gets a chance to go into regenerative mode. This is known as autophagy in a lot of ways. This is important and it does really play a role, but it's not just autophagy, it's just overall less growth signaling. Excess growth is a problem. 
We obviously know that. Now, the other piece that goes right in line with that is something called AMPK. Okay, AMPK is an energy sensor within the body. When AMPK is upregulated or phosphorylated, it means that we are in a deficit. Okay, now that deficit, we're talking predominantly short term at this point in time, not necessarily overall deficit over a 24 hour period. But anytime you're in a deficit, whether it's because you're not eating enough or you're exercising so much that you are exceeding what you have available for energy, that's going to increase AMPK. AMPK is going to trigger the body to utilize glucose that's in the system. It's going to trigger the body to utilize fats that are already in the system. And along with that comes a bunch of different cellular processes that are beneficial for quality of life when it comes down to longevity and aging. This is really cool stuff. In fact, if you look at the research, that's exactly what metformin does, right? Metformin is a type two diabetes drug that is used to upregulate AMPK so that the cells soak up the glucose and they're used so that it brings the glucose down. So we've seen metformin even used in aging research. Although I have some qualms about using metformin for aging because I feel like there's some benefits to having the occasional mTOR1C spike, but that's a different story for a different day. So putting yourself in a deficit via exercise can have very similar benefits to putting yourself in a deficit via caloric restriction or fasting. Then I promised I would talk about sirtuins again. Now sirtuins are more complicated and they deserve their own video and I've done separate videos on that. But essentially when we get older, we are less efficient at utilizing glucose, okay? So this is one of the reasons why we end up having less NAD available. Now, NAD, as I mentioned before, helps carry glucose energy into a cell to be used as fuel, okay? It's a very colloquial way of putting it. it, has to do more with electrons and kind of the breakdown of that. But essentially, when we eat less, we are requiring less NAD at that point in time. If less NAD is required to carry energy into a cell, then it, it's a busybody. It has to do something. So then that excess NAD that's available, what it does is it travels and it activates something called a sirtuin. Sirtuins upregulate all kinds of things that have to do with repair. Okay, there's SIRT1, there's SIRT3, there's all kinds of different sirtuins. And again, we're not gonna go into detail there, but these are like little workers that go to work on rejuvenation and regeneration overall. So basically, by restricting our calories, we have more NAD available to go do other things because again, it has to be kept busy. But now we're starting to see some stuff called inflammaging. When we're actually able to look at imaging and look at inflammation via imaging, we're starting to see that there are some positive correlations between sirtuin activation and suppression of inflammation as well. Now that could play a role, of course, in the longevity piece, but it really can play a role in the quality of life piece. So putting this all together as an overview, the basic things that you can do are gonna be periodic caloric deficits, whether it's through fasting or not, but not all the time, okay? Because if you calorically restrict too much, guess what happens? You adapt to that and you no longer get the hormetic stressor from it, okay? So you need to make sure that caloric restriction is an anomaly so that you get the stressor from it. The occasional stressful workout or workout week even better. Load up on reactive oxygen species and then let the body deal with it for a couple weeks after that and recoup. Okay, extreme exposure or exposure to extreme heat and extreme cold. Ice plunge for two minutes, three minutes, couple times per week. Sauna for 15, 20 minutes, one to four times per week depending on your situation. Okay, these kinds of things are very important. Also, the reduction of refined carbohydrates so that you're not having huge boluses of unnatural amounts of carbohydrates coming into your body that the body has to try to deal with and therefore soak up, use up all that NAD so that you don't have the ability to do it, to deal with it, right? And then the other thing that you can start doing is looking at ways to improve NAD availability within your body, okay? That's a very big one too and that's much more of the nerdy stuff. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.